Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Catherine Doe, a product marketing director for our risk solutions here at Equifax. We've been talking about economic headwinds facing the industry a lot this year, and today we'll be focusing on marketing in particular. As a result of our economic uncertainty, financial industries are pulling back on their marketing efforts, but is that really the right strategy? And where can we find opportunities for growth? Joining us today is Andrew Davidson, Chief Insights Officer at Mintel Comper Media. Andrew's an expert in cross-channel marketing insights, consumer behavior, and global trends. He's also the host of the very successful Mintel Little Conversations podcast. Andrew joined us last month on a Market Pulse webinar titled How to Optimize Marketing Strategies in an Uncertain Environment. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So we'll pause just for a moment here and we'll uh, let David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics, set the stage with a brief economic update. David? Thanks, Catherine. Uh, The Federal Open Market Committee gave us a 25 basis point hike last week. Uh, The target range is now five and five and a quarter. And the wording from the meeting suggests that the FOMC expects May's increase to be the last of the tightening cycle. This aligns with Moody's Analytics latest baseline forecast, which calls for a pause beginning in June. Putting regional banks' vulnerabilities aside, the FOMC can feel good about the U.S. macroeconomy's reaction to its rapid policy tightening and where inflation is headed for several reasons. First, inflation is modestly decelerating. I emphasize the word modestly there. Primarily, the encouragement is coming from the labor market. Payroll gains accelerated from March to April but there were some downward revisions to the previous months, which were significant. Job growth was broad-based, which is encouraging, uh, and, and if, when it was across many uh, industry classifications. Only wholesale sale trade saw a contraction in headcount from the March levels. April's jobs report is a clear indication that the Fed's rapid tightening of the past year or so has not broken the labor market. The, and the other interesting piece of economic news we got was from the uh, highly anticipated senior loan officers survey, which revealed uh, that banks meaningfully tightened standards over the first quarter of this year. The net percentage of banks raising credit standards for commercial and industrial loans increased to 46%, which is slightly higher than 44.8% reported in January. The survey respondents on net reported tighter standards and weaker demand for all commercial real estate loans. Similarly, Banks reported tighter standards across nearly all residential real estate loans, excluding GSE eligible and government residential loans. While demand for residential loan categories fell overall, banks continued to heighten standards for all categories of consumer credit, while demand continued to deteriorate, the decline was less severe than it was last quarter. That's it for this week. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, David. Okay, Andrew, so let's dig in. We know there's a lot of conflicting information when it comes to the macro environment, but what do you think and and what does uh, Mintel Compromedia think and see for the reality for our consumers today? Well, yeah, indeed, there is so much uh, contradictory information and obviously inflation, while coming down, it remains stubbornly high and we in this environment, record high interest rates, and yet consumers are still spending. We saw last week's job report that exceeded expectations. I think one of the lessons that I've learned from the past few months is really to question and really question all of these indicators. You know, from the consumer perspective, you know, regardless of the national picture, this psychology of recession is very real. And consumers are, you know, they're changing their behavior due to inflation. You know, they're they're bulk buying, they're hunting for discounts, they're, they're stocking up. You know, I think banks need to be you know, very much aware of how consumer needs are changing and really to innovate around value. And I think it's important, though, to stress, you know, from the consumer perspective that it's not everybody is impacted equally. Half of consumers say inflation has caused them to cut back on their spending, but others might be prioritizing essentials or postponing large ticket items. So it's really, a, you know, really comes down to understanding your customers, understanding your data. You know, obviously you can only control what you can control. And, you know, fi- you know final point I'll say about this is I think it's, you know, we are seeing some shifts and changes in behavior. Of course, while credit and debit still dominate in terms of 
consumer preferences for payments, one thing that started to pop up in our data is actually an increase in some consumers turning to cash as a way to budget okay. you know, during, during this time. So, and, and that you know, brings to mind things like, well, the importance of things like budgeting tools and helping consumers to navigate mm-hmm. uh, this uncertain time. Great. And so that's a good perspective on on what our consumers are seeing and thinking about financial institutions and knowing that they still have numbers they're trying to hit. They have targets and looking for opportunities for growth. Many have adjusted their marketing strategies. So what are you seeing on your end and where do you suggest they find opportunities for growth? Yeah, well, you know, in a recession, we typically see a cutback in marketing spend. We saw, you know, a cutback in 2008-9. We saw mm-hmm. a cutback during the pandemic recession of 2020. We're already seeing it, as you say, you know, total marketing spend through the channels we track with Compare Media Omni, which includes digital sets like paid Facebook, paid mm-hmm. Instagram, online display, advertising, video, direct mail, TV. You know, we, we track a good chunk of these channels Total spend on those channels was down 29% in the latest quarter. That's Q1 of 2023 across financial services. Mm -hmm. And of course, the bulk of marketing spend is on the sub industries of credit cards and mortgages and loans. Both were down, but mortgages and loans were effectively in free fall. They're down a staggering 46% Mm -hmm. from last year. And that's looking at the latest data from Q1 of 2023. So, you know, we've seen some a more positive activity perhaps on the deposit side, but on the credit side, clearly seeing a pullback, mm-hmm. you know, and given, you know, obviously with the, the continued rise in interest rates, we just saw another increase. And of course, you know, it's one of the key outputs of the Silicon Valley Bank mm-hmm. and the unfolding banking crisis was this credit tightening, which I think I know you've talked about on this podcast in the past. Yeah. The, the way that we that plays through, of course, into marketing is that we'll see a continued decline in marketing as a supply of credit to the U.S. consumer. But, you know, you, 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 know, you mentioned about opportunities. Um, mm-hmm. You know, of course, in a downturn, there are plenty of opportunities. You know, as some uh, companies and some brands cut back, there remain opportunities to step forward into that gap if you have the right risk profile, if you have the right target. So from a marketing perspective, from a product perspective, for example, in the personal loan space, Discover has been very explicit and open about how it sees this environment as an opportunity. Goldman Sachs Mark has pulled out of loans, mm-hmm. you know, other lenders have pulled back. And so Discover sees that as an opportunity to push forward with its marketing. And but on the product side, of course, plenty of opportunities, pockets of opportunity if you can find them. And so that might be a shifting emphasis towards deposits to continue to grow. Or it might be a shifting emphasis towards things like home equity loans. I, one company that I've been speaking about a lot recently that really sort of demonstrates both aspects of this, sort of the marketing opportunity and the product opportunity, is SoFi. Oh, and, you know, okay. SoFi's, yeah, they, I mean, they've continued to innovate, continued to launch new products, mm-hmm. continued to promote those products. You know, last year they launched a, a checking and savings account. Mm-hmm which gives additional benefits to across all of their sort of product suites. And whereas we've seen, you know, the industry pullback in things like mortgage and loan, you've got companies like SoFi that are, you know, pushing forward. We dig into our Compare Media Omni data and we can mm-hmm. see them ramping up. You know, so seeing this as an opportunity, seeing an opportunity to grow deposits and grow their customer base. Very cool. And SoFi has been a guest on one of our Equifax podcasts in the oh. past. So yeah, familiar name for this channel. So you mentioned credit card marketing. Um, maybe you can tell me a little bit more on the insights you have when it comes to driving new accounts today in this environment. Yeah, we have some Intel data. 22% of consumers say that inflation has caused them to use their credit cards more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's something we of course, we're hearing a lot. We've seen yeah. that consumers are using their credit cards more. Outstanding credit card debt is on track to surpass a trillion dollars. So it's clear that usage and reliance on credit cards is up. And of course, that's at a time when we're seeing interest rates on credit cards at a record high. But I think overall, that means there's still plenty of opportunity, despite the shifting narrative and shifting landscape, there's still plenty of opportunity to acquire new customers. I think, you know, one obviously delinquencies are on the rise. We've mm-hmm. seen that. We've seen that reported. And there are signs that of a sort of flight to safety of perhaps a more 
cautious approach. You know, I mentioned already the, the pullback in marketing. Another example, though, is that Q1 of this year, you know, while there was this broader pullback in marketing, biggest cutbacks were in the non-rewards segment. So those mm. credit cards, offers, promoting or trying to target revolvers. And that's something that we saw back in the recession of 2008-9, that sort of shift to a more cautious, that sort of flight to safety. Mm-hmm. So we start, start seeing things like that start to evolve. Teaser rate offers, for example. So teaser rates was very much the marketing story for credit cards in 2022. They were really coming through very strongly, um, even though there remained that continued discussion around recession. But we've seen something of a pullback there, even though there are still plenty of offers on the market right now with an intro APR of 21 months. Mm -hmm. So you are seeing some shifts in the dynamics, really. And of course, credit card interest rates are still at record high. So there there are opportunities for issuers, credit unions to compete on rate Mm -hmm. in this current environment. You know, I think if you if you flip though over on, onto the reward side, I think it's about finding new ways to find efficiencies to add value. For example, in the co-brand space, we saw a slow start to the year in terms of new card launches, but since then it's really kicked up a notch, and we're seeing new types of partnership. So the likes of AMC Theatres with the fintech Deserve or Simon Malls with the fintech Cardless. These are all examples of new types of partnerships that are emerging in the current environment. So as I say, it goes back to these pockets of hunting these pockets of opportunities. I think it's about being more targeted. It's about adding value. I live in Manhattan and um, I was on 34th Street the other day. There's a huge billboard for Citizens Bank, which is taking over New York, but it was for the Citizens Bank cashback card offering 10% back for a limited time. But the the twist was that it's specifically for New York, New Jersey residents, and it was a limited time offer. So, you know, just a great example of a more personalized approach, but still marketing, you know, really strong marketing to try and get that message out there. Huge QR code just under the shadow of the Empire State Building. (laughs) Very New York. Um, Yes. And I'm going to go a little bit off script here, Andrew, so you you, you can... Tell me no, let's not talk about this. Yeah, sure. But you were talking yeah. about rewards cards and in my personal life, I wanted to get out. I wanted to see Europe this summer. And I understand that there are a lot of people that are very interested in doing the same. So if we're talking about mm-hmm. maybe an area that's been successful, what are you guys seeing for rewards cards pertaining to travel? Is that something that's done particularly well now that people had up that pent up demand for travel? Is, is that moving the needle better than other reward segments? Yeah, I mean, you, you're spot on. Obviously, I mentioned credit cards being one of the still opportunities mm-hmm. for acquisition, still consumers still spending. And one of those categories that is particularly resilient even now is travel. Mm -hmm. And so we continue to see a lot of competition in the travel space, whether it's on the co-branded side or the bank branded side of, you know, issuers trying to compete for customers who are still looking and willing to spend on travel. You know, in fact, that extends from fee-based products, but also to those sort of ultra premium cards like Capital One Venture X or Amex Platinum or Chase Sapphire Reserve. In fact, I'm sure if you travel through an airport these days, it's almost like a a microcosm of the uh, credit card industry, a sort of marketing battle that's playing out as you walk through the terminal. You know, we refer to lounge wars as each of these (laughs) issuers builds up and and invests in their lounge networks. So, yes, definitely some pockets of of continued opportunity in the credit card space. Mm. Well, let's switch gears a little bit to mortgages. Um, You've already mentioned, and we certainly covered on this podcast in previous episodes, we all know it's a Mm. tough environment for mortgages. But again, thinking about, you know, I just sat on my screen porch yesterday talking with a group of friends and they were saying, we still are thinking about how we love to move and we're thinking a little bit harder now. But how how is it that you market mortgages in this environment with tough rates? Well, that's right. And some people have been sitting on the sidelines for, for quite a long mm-hmm. time. You know, I know the Mortgage Bankers Association has projected that mortgage originations will drop 16%. Well, that was the last time I saw their projection. So obviously, like you say, clearly a, a still a very tough time for mortgages until the markets really start to turn. So in that meantime, I think it goes back to this point we're talking about with credit cards, it's about sort of seeking out diff- different pockets of opportunity. You know, you know, two companies really stand out to me that have done a really 
sort of amazing job in terms of innovating and looking for opportunities both in the short and the long term. You know, number one is Rocket Mortgage. Mm-hmm. Obviously, really challenging environment for Rocket Mortgage, but they've continued to innovate, continued to invest in in marketing at the top of the funnel and throughout the funnel quite frankly. To handle the short-term environment, they launched something called their Inflation Buster campaign, Mm. where you can get a 1% discount off your mortgage uh, with rates particularly high. But I think what even more is sort of interesting, they launched something called Rocket Money, which is an app which allows you to check your credit scores, allows you to cancel subscriptions and allows you to do some budgeting. They then recently launched a Rocket Visa card, so a credit card, as well as a Rocket Rewards program. And I get all innovative products with the idea, of course, being that they are designed to engage customers earlier on in the process Mm -hmm. to lower the cost of acquisition. Well, if you're not necessarily in the mortgage market for a mortgage right now, you know, we want to engage with you and be ready for you and have a relationship for you when you are ready. Maybe that's Mm -hmm. later in 2023 or early in 2024. So that's really stood out to me as a sort of interesting and innovative strategy. But the other example I think is Fifth Third. And Fifth Third recently launched its rate drop protector for mortgages, where now new customers can refinance. So if they take on a new mortgage with Fifth Third, they can refinance within six to 24 months without having to pay fees. So I think the savings were sort of around $1,300. Mm-hmm. So and what I love about that, it's the first example of a product sort of designed for when the rates are starting to fall. Because, of course, now, if you're like you talk about sitting on your on your porch talking about mortgages, well, now if rates are coming down, is it now, you know, rates were going up. Is it a good time? Shall we wait? Now rates are coming down. Well, hang on. They're going to come down even more. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should wait. So it's obviously addressing those concerns of potential mortgage customers. Well, let's think about maybe some consumer segments and Mm. switch to some of the the younger folks, maybe just becoming acquainted with managing their own finances like Gen Z. And what do you think is working for financial institutions to attract that audience? Where, Where are you seeing success there? Yeah, I mean, at Mintel, we define Gen Z as age between 13 and 26. Mm -hmm. So, you know, many of them are still kids, which is interesting in itself because I personally believe that's an area where sort of the financial services has been fairly lacking in general. We've seen some interesting companies now moving into the space like Greenlight. Chase launched a a teen banking product. Mm -hmm. But if we focus on the sort of the adult Gen Z, you know, they're very much in this transitionary phase. You know, they're, it's their, they're, they're going to college, they're getting their first job, they're getting their first car. And of course, then when it comes to financial services, that often means it's their first bank account, their first loan, their first credit card, their first checking account, for example. So I think it, it really boils down to, you know, obviously marketing 101, understanding the audience, but having, having the right product because it often will be their first account. I have a Gen Z, turned 18 last year. I think the first credit card offer he received in the mail was for a United, you know, a United mileage card. I think it had an annual fee. You know, and you know, of course he'd sign, you know, I'd signed him up for the United mileage program. So that's why he ended up getting that offer, but it just struck me that here here he was, you know, someone who's 18 at the time getting their first credit card offer. And there was a bit of a missed opportunity because there was no explanation of really what a credit card was and how to use a credit card. It was all about getting your miles. Mm -hmm. And and while that might sound okay, well, you might sort of brush that example off and say, okay, well, it's a miles example. I think from the traditional banks, there is that missed opportunity to really, you know, to step in and do something different, which is why you see, you know, fintechs, for example, looking so relevant and being so relevant in the current space. You know, so a great example, I think, that we see in the marketing is Chime, the fintech yeah, Chime. Yeah. And they have a secured card, their, their credit builder card, which, of course, they market as a way to build your credit score. Mm-hmm. And they've kind of taken secured cards, which was, you know, historically or traditionally a fairly, you know, let's just say not a particularly fashionable right. product. Right. And they've made it sort of trendy. It's sort of, you know, appealing. They've leveraging you know, a lot of top of funnel marketing, a lot of digital Instagram marketing, but also national TV. Mm-hmm, yeah. Because of course, they've got to bring their brand to market. These Gen Z consumers, they have not heard of these brands. So they need to obviously make sure they're aware of them and they've continued to push forward. 
with that sort of brand marketing. And of course, you know, in a, in a downturn, there is always that debate, you know, whether it's between you know, getting the balance right between brand and performance. Mm-hmm. And it's a great example of how a company has continued to push forward its brand because at the end of the day, those are its future customers. But, you know, I think there's plenty to say about, you know, Gen Z. I mean, so much is about reaching them with the right language, being where they are, where they spend their time, you know, whether that's on different social platforms, for example. We've been speaking a lot at uh, Mintel about Fidelity, which of course, uh, yes, it's an investment company, but you wouldn't necessarily associate Fidelity with sort of a cutting edge social media strategy, but they're on every social media channel you can think of, whether it's the metaverse or TikTok, you know, Fidelity's there. And what's fascinating if you look at the strategy is it's always extremely relevant for the channel. It's always extremely authentic. They seem to have a good understanding of where these Gen Z customers are spending their time, but also you know, serving up a message which is appropriate for the channel and entertaining and relevant for the Gen Z consumer. I I guess, you know, I'll make one more point really on on Gen Z is that, you know, I think there's a a point to, like I sort of talked about so far, I think there's one company that sort of pulls it all together very nicely and that's Cash App. You know, I think a lot of folks underestimate Cash App. In our data, 57% of Gen Z consumers use or have used cash app Mm -hmm. versus 41 percent who have used venmo and i think it tends to be underestimated a little bit and it's designing products for its users specifically the right tone the right message and of course it's not just about sending money you know it's a p2p Mm -hmm. payment platform but they've built out banking they've built out investments and they have that long-term vision to do that and i think you know when it comes to gen z There's a lot more of an interest and a desire to manage all of their financial services in one app. Yeah. You know, in in the old days, we might say, well, you know, you don't want to keep all your eggs in one basket. Well, nowadays, the utility of the app is so compelling Mm -hmm. that, you know, particularly for um, more younger segments, Gen Z, millennials, but also Gen X, actually, are, are preferring to have their financial services products in one app. So, you know, and there are a number of fintechs in particular that do a particularly good job of pulling that together and then marketing that message. Mm. And I'm probably dating myself here, but I'm remembering back to my first credit card and it was a fraternity that walked down the halls in the dorms and got you to sign up with an application and you turned it over and, and a credit card came in the mail. So... Things have come funny. a very yes. long way uh, yeah, yeah. In, in both technology and regulation, probably for a good thing. And so I'm going to ask one last question. It's always my favorite one to end the podcast with. In all of your podcast work or your, your work in for, for Mintel Compromedia, what are people not asking you about that you think that maybe segments are missing or the industry is missing that you wish you'd be asked so you could talk about it as, um, you know, something important going on right now? Yeah. You know, I think... I think, um, you know, my sense is that banks, uh, consumers, certainly consumers, banks are not prepared. I think it's difficult to see beyond the immediate uh, imminent discussion around potential recession. And there's still so much uncertainty with how things are playing out. You know, we've been talking about a recession for well over a year. So it's difficult. I think it's difficult for banks to see beyond that. You know, I think that that example from Fifth Third, who's a great example and one of very few that we've seen that are sort of starting to think beyond the current mm-hmm. environment. The Federal Reserve, of course, has indicated very strongly that they anticipate us moving to a declining rate environment next year. Mm-hmm. So, okay, yeah, they they increased rates. They've now sort of, there was some hinted at perhaps this, there might be a pause, but they were very strong in their projections that you know, next year would be in a declining rate mm-hmm. environment. That's a very different environment. Right. So do you have the right products, the right marketing messages? I, I kind of think about it almost like a mixer, you know, a mixing desk or a graphic equalizer where you're sort of try, trying to balance the right products and adjust them and, and adapt them and evolve them as the environment shifts and changes. So I think most banks will take a cautious approach when it comes to dropping rates mm-hmm. once we start to move into that environment and we might see less movement in deposits. So gaming out campaigns, innovation, and being prepared for that narrative shift is key. 
Right. But you know, I think you know, the, I you know, the landscape has shifted, and I think, um, and it continues to evolve. So there are new opportunities, and we've talked about many today, but there are obviously plenty of threats. So companies that see the shifts and can identify the opportunities will be the winners in this uncertain environment. So I think what we're not being asked is, you know, what we're not really being asked what's next. You know, there mm -hmm. is that focus on the immediate future, the concerns about obviously what's going to happen in a downturn. And I think, you know, the landscape has shifted and it continues to evolve. And so we continue to see new opportunities and threats emerge and companies that see those shifts and identify those opportunities will be the winners in the current environment. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Andrew. We really appreciate you joining us again on this platform um, after our, our webinar as well. Uh, if our audience would like to follow up with you, how can they get in touch? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm always posting about financial services, product and marketing strategy. Find me on there, Andrew Davidson, Mintel. I'd love to connect with you on Mintel. If you want to know more about Mintel, you can find us at mintel.com. But yeah. Awesome. Hope you'll join us again, Andrew. If you enjoyed today's episode, tell your friends about Market Pulse and please subscribe. If you'd like to send us any feedback or questions or perhaps suggested topics for the future, uh, email us at marketpulsepodcast at equifax.com. And don't forget to register for our webinar series. You can do that at equifax.com forward slash market pulse. We'll continue to provide relevant economic and credit updates uh, to help your business make more confident decisions. Thanks for listening and we hope you'll join us next time. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.